Hey everyone, this is Mike Dunn. I'm Julie Cook. And I'm Janine Dunn. And you are listening to Rethinking EDU. Hey, thanks for all coming back here and listening after our brief hiatus. I think Julie and Janine would agree that um, we spent the last couple months, like, uh, you know, not drowning in schoolwork. Would you... Would you all agree with that statement or, or what? We've got our sea legs back. We're, we're okay, but we needed to take a step back and i um, happy to be back uh, with you guys today. Yeah, likewise. And if uh, you're listening to this and you're not, and you didn't know this, we are also um, all three of us in a doctoral program right now. So, you know, we've been trying to do Zoom school the last uh, few months and also, um, you know, collecting data for our dissertations, like... What? What are we thinking? I don't. I don't even... <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so that so that's been going on, but whatever. Here we are back again to chat with you all about rethinking EDU, and as much as we don't want to be, we are still here in a pandemic. Wah wah. Um, and we want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, teacher burnout, which I think is like pretty serious um, these days. And, you know, we were just reading an article and talking about this before we, we started the recording this evening um, about the number of teachers that are just thinking about retirement or quitting or all the things, you know, because the work that we're doing right now is so challenging and probably not what a lot of people signed up for. And uh, I know that's certainly been true at, at my school. And Janine and Julie, what about for you all? Has that been true at your school? What what has been kind of teachers' feelings the last couple months? I think a general feeling of being overwhelmed. Um, I know uh, the teachers at our school are all very positive people, and you know are, are willing to do whatever it takes. I, I think that probably we should probably have T-shirts made that say like whatever it takes. But 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 yeah, I mean, at some point there does come a cost, and you know, I think that. Yeah, a general sense of being overwhelmed. Would you agree, Julie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's just been a lot to rework and rethink um, and just reinvent everything. Um, when I think about, I've been very thankful that I had some years under my belt as this pandemic hit. Uh, that muscle memory has been sort of useful for me. Um, so I think where you know Janine and I are, where are, the content really has taken care of itself. Um, but reinventing that process or that approach has been a challenge, I think, across the board for every teacher in our school. Um, so because I've been teaching for a while, I have a lot of resources and ideas, and I've been able to stay flexible. And I think that's true for all teachers that I know. Um, but wow, am I tired, right? So it's a lot to have students at home and students in front of me, all of the different protocols in place. And just like this low level stress at all times that, you know, we don't want to have anybody get sick um, or bring it back to someone at home. Um, it's just a, a lot of stress there to navigate it all. Um, and certainly if you had told me like 10 years ago, this is how I'd be teaching now, I would not have been able to imagine it. Um, I just thought, you know, wow, it's been a lot. Yeah. And, and so let's get into like the the nitty gritty of what that's looked like for either of you. What do you think has been the thing that's sort of been like taking up most of your time that has been unexpected um, in the last couple of months? I would say clicking on Google Classroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I was going to say the same thing. I've spent so much time on Google Classroom, like clicking through assignments and I never realized how, yeah, yeah, I never realized how much I valued like fast internet and being able to like navigate through web pages quickly. But Google Classroom has like this lag, at least for me, that it's like you click on an assignment, you know, type in a little comment, you know, mark it up a little bit, um, send it back to the student with a grade and that, or with, with some points or whatever. And that moment when you're sending it back to the student, for me, takes probably like seven or eight seconds, maybe 10 seconds, maybe 12 <laughs> seconds. I know it sounds ridiculous, right? But when you're getting up into 50, 60 students, you're all of a sudden talking about like minutes and hours of time that you're just sitting there waiting 
for Google Classroom to do its thing. Or little things that you could have done with an eye shot, like, you know, hey, you know, everybody get this out or whatever, let's check it out. Um, you can just sort of scan the room. Not everything has to be, you know, virtual or whatever. Uh, so it's just, it's been, a, that's been tedious, uh, but also pretty cool. Um, a lot that we've been able to reinvent has been kind of interesting and, um, and hopefully if, you know, kept the kids moving in a, a forward direction as much as possible. But yeah, if you ask me what, what's slowing me down or, or getting me down, all that clicking and all the time on the computer. Yeah, I would say, you know, the amount of planning to make this all work um, is immense. I don't know. I, I We've reworked our entire curriculum in order to make it work for students that are coming in person as well as those that are virtual. And, um, you know, I just think the amount of time that it takes to pull that off is is a, a lot. And I know a lot of teachers are staying up really late and, you know, not getting a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of nights I haven't, been, I've been going to bed after midnight because of either having the plan or trying to keep up with grading things and getting things returned back to students in, you know, with timely feedback. Um, it just, everything takes longer. <laughs> it seems right now. When I think about, when I talked about reinventing, um, we've really had to, so we were a school where it was kind of a get your hands messy kind of school, get out of the building as much as possible, um, where we had all these fieldwork opportunities and a lot of personalized education where we're, you know, taking, um, the, the kids had some, you know, skin in the game like they could they could decide you know we're going here where, where do we want to go what's next what do we want to learn about and really having them as partners where I think we've had to we've kept a lot of that independent study aspect um, but certainly all of the field work you know is out of the window so it's just reinventing and rethinking and how to keep it active how to keep that project-based um, piece in you know, without leaving the building, it's and and not collaborating um, in person. Um, everything just becomes more cumbersome and um, just trickier to navigate, I guess. Well, I guess at the same time too, trying to still make school fun. You know, yeah, uh, that, yeah. You know, you know, trying to take that weight off of the kids. It, you know, you have to put on your happy face every day too. And I, there's an emotional toll, I think, there for the teachers that you you have this stress that's happening, but at the same time, you have to put your best foot forward and, you know, <laughs> almost put on an act for the kids so that they don't, you know, follow your lead there. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think it's in my experience working with older kids, they've been pretty understanding of the stress that teachers have been going through, but also, um, I, I think they also want to learn like they're, they don't want to be sitting at home. They want to have interesting experiences in school. They want to have things that they're doing that are compelling to them, at least from my school. Um, and I think it speaks to the, the drudgery of the pandemic for so many young people that some people are just like at home. And their parents are like, no, you need to stay home. And the kids are like, okay, I guess I'm staying home. And that's not a problem, but it just is really hard when you're an adolescent, you know, um, when you're used to being active in whatever way that you, whatever way that is good for your brain and good for your body. And here you are not able to do that. I think it's super hard. I think the other thing that's been taking a really long time for me is that like getting a read on interpersonal relationships, like a one-on-one -on -one conversations with students and really trying to dig through the like um, ideas that students might have for their future, which is a big part of my job, uh, is really, really challenging when you're not able to have those conversations in person because those those conversations are so, you know, based on body language and reading people's uh, expressions and um, supporting people in uh, in your body language and helping people feel comfortable expressing things that they might not even be fully formed ideas yet. And all of that has just made my job take a lot longer. So a one-on-one -on -one conversation that I have with a kid now 
that may have taken 15 minutes last year now takes at least a half an hour. And so then I'm like, whoa, okay. Um, I'm blocking away this half an hour of time, but that's double the amount of time I would have had to take last year. And the student, we're still accomplishing the same goal, but just the number of hours I've had to work has increased because of, of that, you know? Um, and I think to go along with that is that there's some students that really are struggling with executive functioning as, um, in our last episode, I chatted with Elizabeth Hamblett about that. Um, and those students are struggling even more than they were before. All of that is just amplified now. Um, especially when you're on your, on your own at, and you're at home. Um, and even the students that are in front of me, what I've noticed is that there's less opportunities in the classroom because we're not moving around um, to have conversations without an adult present um, during the school day. Um, so students who are at home uh, might be thinking like, you know, all of the students in school are having this social time. Um, but really, it's, it's, you know, a teacher in the room and, you know, we're in these smaller cohorts and it just everything is a little different as far as the interactions that people are having, and which I think is a big loss. So I, I really try to make opportunities for that during the day, but it's, it's just been a challenge with the physical distancing as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's pivot a little bit and talk about something positive. What's one thing that you feel like has maybe changed for the better over the last few months? Have you experienced something like that? Has there been any like silver lining to your first uh, semester slash, you know, quarter and three quarters of the school year? I think our team really came together and we're able to come up with some really great virtual resources to use um, for moving forward and present it in a way to the students that was meaningful and made sense. Um, our, our curriculum is very integrated, so there's overlaps between, you know, history and science and math and ELA. Um, you know, we, so we ended up developing different websites for each of our units um, so that the students would be able to easily access them, whether they were in school or not in school, and and ticked and tied everything to Google Classroom. So, I mean, um, as much time and effort that that took to put together, I think it was a, a great accomplishment, actually, because it'll be there for the future and we'll be able to continue to tweak it and use it. So I think the work that we've done has been helpful. Yeah. And I I would say from the student's perspective, I mean, these kids are going to be tech savvy. Um, They're going to be resilient. They're going to have some agency over their own learning. Um, They've definitely had to, you know, wrestle with who am I as a learner Um, So that whole idea that a student is really in charge of his or her own learning, um, that, that seems to me what's, what's risen uh, to the top here, as far as what I've seen um, students having something to take away with them, because this will end. I think that's another thing. I have a a perspective since I've been teaching for so long, like this isn't forever. Um, This is, you know, a year, um, and a little bit of, of a, a child's life, uh, we can rebound from this. Um, so there will be things they take away and it won't all be you know, a wash or a loss um, or a negative. I, I have to believe that some of this um, in learning to navigate right along with us is going to, to be a positive. Um, so I'll, it'll be, I'll be interested to see uh, what, they, what they've taken away from this and what they will expect of their own education going forward. Um, Certainly there's been some takeaways. Yeah, I think after the pandemic, it will necessitate, really, if we want to learn and grow as a community of teachers and learners across the board, public, private, charter, homeschool, whomever, I think it will necessitate a, a series of conversations and reflections like, man, that was really hard. That was a year's worth of our lives that have been really, were really challenging. But like, what did we learn in that experience? What did we figure out was um, really working for you as a student? And what do we figure out was really working for you as a teacher? And what do we really figure out that wasn't? And I think for me, for example, one thing that has gone really well these this last semester or so for us has been we've started conducting these like support 
um, sessions for our seniors as they've been going through their um, dual enrollment college experiences. So seniors at our school are able to take a couple of college classes their senior year, and it is a part of built into their schedule and it's available to most of our seniors. Um, and in the past, we've typically had these study experiences with with these students that were like a little bit larger in group. We're just trying to make sure that they're making progress. But this year we've done some really great things with remote learning that have allowed us to meet individually with students more often and really diagnose and help them figure out what they need to do to be more successful in their dual enrollment classes. And that's been like, I think, a revelation for a lot of those young people. They've been like, whoa, this has been really helpful. And I don't think I would have gotten through this had I not had this extra support. And here's what that could mean for my future. Maybe I just need to meet with an executive functioning coach once a week. Maybe I need to meet with an executive functioning coach once a month. You know, anything along those lines has allowed our students to kind of like be a little bit more self-actualizing and self-reflective and, um, you know, critical of their learning processes in ways that I think are really positive. So I think for us, that's been, for me, I should say, and other people in my school, I think that that's been really, um, really helpful. Uh, I think what's been really hard for me to see this past semester though has been the number of teachers that have been like i'm out just like give me get me away from schools get me out of the classroom and i don't think that that's a product of um teachers hating teaching all of a sudden you know it's a product of like the burden that this job has placed upon teachers in the in the last little um you know in the last little blip of time here and we were just reading this article beforehand um talking about it that they're saying uh from the new york times they're saying that in minnesota the number of teachers applying for retirement benefits has increased by 35 percent and and then in pennsylvania by 60 percent like that's insane <laughs> i mean what are we what are we realistically going to do with that sh that like I, I don't understand that number of fewer teachers you just can't staff schools you know with with that with those number of fewer teachers and do so equitably for um for students like what kind of ramifications do either of you see for something like this happening well i guess uh, we will work harder to keep them where they are perhaps that would that would be a one positive step maybe um or we will work harder to make sure that once teachers leave that the teachers who fill their shoes will will stay um so i think mm. so so what hmm. you're suggesting julie is like greater efforts toward teacher retention more broadly um, I, I think it's going to have to be if if you can just replace um any teacher at a moment's notice, which I think has been historically the case, at least in some areas, um, not in all, um, certainly not in, you know, I guess typically in math and science in the upper grades or whatever, but there are places where it's just, well, if you move on, you move on and it's fine, um, then nothing ever changes, right? So these professional working experience of teachers doesn't change all that much um, as the decades uh, wear on here. So, uh, yeah, I think perhaps that will be um, a side effect. It might also be the case that we have a lot of teachers who are teaching for less than five years, you know, um, coming into the profession. Yeah, that's interesting. I have seen a little bit of that as well, that my school, which is an independent school, so it has the freedom to be able to select the right person for the job and work with them on their certification within the first couple of years of coming to the school without an emergency certification. Um, but we have, we, we have had issues, you know, filling roles because we've needed additional support staff. We want those support staff to be certified as well. We've also had issues with like teachers leaving because they just, can't handle or didn't want to handle the stress of teaching in the pandemic. Um, 
and we've had struggles. And so we've picked up like, you know, test prep tutors that were out of work because nobody's taking tests these days to help come and support the work of our students in whatever way they can. And that's been fine, but it's been much less than ideal for us. You know, we've wanted more highly qualified people with not just years of experience, but um, but also people trained to work with students. Um, and it's just been really challenging to find those people. I mean, we would love everybody to have years of experience, but like, obviously that's not always going to happen and we're okay understanding that. But we we also just want certified teachers. <laughs> and that's been a super challenge. It's been a super challenge. Um, yeah, so do you, do you, either of you think that this might have an impact on like teacher prep programs and the view of teachers as, as professionals? You know, I know that there's been a lot of like controversy around te the profession of teaching, right? The like vision of teachers as, um, high quality, uh, professional educators maybe has come into question in the last few years. Um, do you think that this will change any of that? Well, the public has been fickle on this point. I think right before the, I remember like there was this groundswell of support of teachers, if you recall, um, people were going on strike and people were starting to pay attention to I, I think the financial plight of many teachers, you know, that we're, it's just not sustainable um, in many areas, this career. Um, right, right. In Oklahoma and Arizona, now there were massive teacher strikes because teachers were being paid like, you know, $28,000 a year or $35,000 a year where the cost of living is is much higher. And also like it's a it's a career. It's not just a sort of job that you have. Um, so I think there was a lot of attention to that. Keep going though, Julie. Oh yeah. I think there was a lot of attention. And of course now there isn't. And in the beginning of the pandemic, people were like, we love our teachers. And then, you know, I think there's been people on both sides, you know, teachers have to go back. Teachers want to go back. Uh, teachers are afraid to go back. And there's been opinions on both sides and it's just been really tricky to navigate everything, like I keep saying, um, it's just hard because every decision that's been made, exactly like half the public thinks exactly right and the other half says exactly wrong. So I think it's been putting teachers kind of in the middle um, and, there, and there's no good answers to what we've had to come up with um, this year. It's just, you know, everyone's trying their best um, most of the time. Um, but I, so I don't know, um, what the future holds for people. Like, I can't imagine, you know, will this change like high school kids experience? Uh, is anyone at this point thinking, you know, what I really want to do is what she's doing. I, I don't know if they're looking at their teachers thinking like, that looks like a ton of fun. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, maybe it'll all come out in the wash, but, um, maybe, Maybe it doesn't look like so much fun right now. I don't know. I hope not. I hope that's not the case um, because it is a great profession. Again, looking at the long game, this has only been, um, you know, since last March, uh, we're going to come out of it. Um, but, you know, I do worry about the, the public persona, what people pay attention to and, um, you know, what is in store for us. Um, it, with a shift in power coming. Um, there's a lot of big issues um, on our plates right now that uh, teachers will be the recipients, I feel like, rather than the drivers of any of this. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out. I think that gets into like the, the second topic of conversation we wanted to talk about in this episode, which is about the shift in power that's happening um, with the incoming Biden Harris administration. So, um, you know, we're recording this in the end of December. Um, so in the next, you know, two, three weeks here, president elect Biden will be sworn into office and, um, he has 
already spoken out about uh, his choice for new education secretary. He has chosen uh, Miguel Cardona from uh, Connecticut to be his nominee. Obviously, uh, as of this recording, Dr. Cardona has not been confirmed as the you know nominee. I don't know that there's any sort of like scuttlebutt around whether or not his confirmation is likely or not. I don't think that's where politically what people are caring about right now, right? Um, but a, a couple of interesting things about Dr. Cardona is he is poised to be the first Latino to be uh, appointed to the position of education secretary. His um, He and his family are Puerto Rican, um, and that's super exciting. I think that I'm personally really glad that we have somebody in the position that comes from a background that is really struggling to be equitably represented in education in general right now, whether it's in higher education or K-12 or what have you. Um, so I definitely appreciate that. I think the other thing about um, Dr. Cardona is that he, and this is like the sort of more controversial part of uh, his appointment has only five or so years of um, actual teaching in a classroom experience. You know, he was at he was at an elementary school in uh, Connecticut for five years before becoming a principal. So we're moving from Betsy DeVos, current education secretary, who you know has zero experience teaching in any school to Miguel Cardona, who has uh, five years teaching experience, and then a, a number of other years as a principal and then uh, uh, an assistant superintendent, right? So he has those type of experiences. But I'm curious, for both of your perspective, does this maybe five-year experience have an impact on on his potential to uh, to empathize with maybe a typical classroom teacher? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know yet. Um, I have to learn more <laughs> about him. You know, everything I've read, you know, at first glance, you know, he has a K-12 background, but as you mentioned, he only spent five years in the classroom. Um, and we all know, if you've been around education for a while, you all know teachers who, you hit that five-year mark, and it's either you pursue something else um, and get out of teaching, or you stick it out. I can't say what empathy he feels uh, for teachers teaching in the last recession, for teachers who are teaching in this pandemic, district charter, private school positions. I don't know what kind of experience he has with all of that. Um, I'm hopeful that his background um, will inform him. Um, again, I wish he had more classroom experience. I'm really um, looking forward to more leaders leading from the classroom. Um, and the, the, the admin, I'm, obviously we need that admin perspective, but the teacher perspective right now I think is huge. Um, and it, there's so many things uh, that will need to be addressed. Um, starting with inequity. So I'm, I'm hopeful that he has a, a big picture view of what the whole country needs right now, um, a unifying force. Um, so I, I'm hopeful. I know his doctoral dissertation, um, I think, was about closing uh, the achievement gap so I'm not sure what the title was, but I read that somewhere. But I was that that makes me hopeful that you know he might get it. You know he might understand all of the moving pieces in education. I think I w I was this this revelation came to me when we were talking with Eva Mejia and Zelia Gonzalez from Big Picture, and I was thinking, man, Zelia would be really great to move her into like some sort of actual policymaker position in her future. I hope she aspires to something like that. Because how many big picture students or EL education students or um, revolution school students or, you know, whomever we've talked to over the last 23 episodes, how many of those students go and then become superintendents? How many of those students then go and become education decision makers? 
And I think the real answer to that is like not very many, right? So I'm hopeful that maybe Miguel's background will provide for him a different view of what education could be and a different understanding of the possibility for education. Janine or Julie, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I had he- I had heard him speak somewhere, and I know he was a real proponent for you know equity in schools and really making sure that every student is challenged, um, you know, and that just because you're poor or whatever the situation might be, that we really care about those students and that we do we do help them to um, you know be the best that they can be. So I I appreciated hearing that from him. Yeah, for sure. Julie, you have any thoughts? I would say going from you know, a, a Connecticut education commissioner, was he? And then now to this position, I mean, wow, what a leap. <laughs> so I think it's going to be, it's going to be an amazing learning curve, but um, I hope he's up to the task and surrounds himself with people who know, like I said. Well, I, I would like to humbly submit my, uh, you know, resume. Yeah, go ahead. I second, you know I second that. Yeah. I'll, I'll write a letter for you. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Like, <laughs> Well, listen, it's been a lovely uh, conversation this evening, but before we go, we always have to talk about what this conversation is making us rethink about education. What, what's coming up for you tonight? I'm just rethinking again um, as we are heading into the new year here and knowing that already thinking about going back to school and running the three ring circus that I've been running, uh, there is that anxiety that uh, is settling in slightly (laughs) um, as that approaches. And I'm just thinking how this, some of these models of between virtual learning and in-person learning and hybrid approaches and everything is just really not sustainable. Um, And that we, we need to think of how we can better support teachers in this crazy time and being able to meet the needs of students um, without sending them over the edge or out of the profession. I think um, we're talking a lot about uh, how to how to make sure that teachers stay. Um, if we start with what is stressing us all out <laughs> and seeing how we can um, really address the needs of the teacher, we are not going to be able to address the needs of all of our students unless we can sort of hang on for this rocky ride that's going to be the next six months until June. Uh, So that's what this has me thinking about is how can we better support the teachers? How can we ask them, what is making you leave? What is making you so stressed out? And how can we remedy uh, some of these situations um, so that it becomes a more sustainable career in the short term and in the long term? Yeah, kind of building off what you're talking about, Julie, I think this conversation has me thinking more about how do we uplift the profession of teaching? You know, and this is always, I think, something that's on my mind, sort of like, you know, dangling in the back there. But in particular, right now, we need to be sharing gratitude with teachers and really understanding that teachers are coming from a place of we're trying our best in a crazy situation, you know? And I think a lot of parents and a lot of students and a lot of districts and a lot of places are doing that. But I think it's it's going to be more important that we do that after the pandemic, because as, as we're seeing, people are leaving teaching. And I think that that's going to be really difficult to get over in the next few years. Like we really need to take time to say, what's going on? Why are people leaving? And how can we do something about that? Because if we don't, we're really going to be underserving our young people, you know, like, like more than we are right now, right? Um, if some out, outstanding groups of teachers decide that they're going to leave, we're just going to have a huge voids, the like cataclysmic voids. And we need to be doing all we can to share joy with teachers and uplift them so they can do their job the best that they can and also make sure that they are supported financially, supported personally, all for the sort of long run of their careers. So yeah, that's what this this conversation is having me think about. 
So listeners, thanks for taking your time to check in with us here on Rethinking EDU. We know it's been a while. We are vowing to be a little bit more consistent with our episodes. We're going to try to release two episodes a month for the next few months and see how that goes as we finish up our dissertations and we, uh, you know, try to make it through the rest of this school year. But please stick with us. We promise to bring on some amazing guests in the next few episodes. We are sure that you will love them. And as always, thanks for Rethinking EDU.